So welcome everybody to this week's edition of the MetaMount seminar. Uh, so this week I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, which is Eric Albert Hiltunen, uh, who is a uh, Gibbs assistant professor at the University of Yale, uh, based in the mathematics department over there. Uh, before being at Yale, uh, Eric was based at ETH Zurich, uh, where he did his PhD under the supervision of Habib Mari. Um, he uh, ended up winning the ETH medal for outstanding PhD thesis at the end of his time there, and then also more recently won the uh, ECOMAS award for best PhD thesis in computational methods and applied sciences. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have Eric this week, and he's going to tell us about some of his recent work on analysis of time-dependent subwave resonators. So Eric, when you're ready, the stage is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction, and, and thank you all for joining. So as I, as I just said, uh, uh, um, if you have any questions throughout during the talk, feel, feel, feel free to interrupt me. We can discuss. Um, otherwise, there will be a there will be a question session, of course, afterwards. So as said, today I will present some work on time dependent sub wavelength resonators. So this is part of my PhD work that I did at the ETH in Zurich. So what I will present today is joint work together with Habib Mari, Jing Hao Kao, and uh, Thea Kosha. So specifically, what we will be interested in today is uh, somehow materials which whose parameters depend on time. And somehow there is a if you look at the wave equation, there is a kind of a duality between the space and time dimensions. Of course, if you have a wave equation in one dimension, then then the space and time dimensions are equivalent, so to speak. So if you have, for example, phenomena that comes from material parameters who depend which depends on, depends on the on space. Of course, you can have similar phenomena if the material parameters depend on time. So kind of the most, I guess, intuitive phenomena is if you have just a, uh, if, if you have an interface, of course, if you have a spatial interface, you can have reflection. Well, if you have an interface in time, so to speak, so you have one material parameter and then suddenly you change to another, another material parameter, you can have something like, something like a reflected wave, but there's some kind of time reflection. Um, another thing wor worth mentioning here is, is if you have material parameters that depend on time, then of course you, you can break time reversal symmetry. So if you're dealing with classical waves, well, usually you will have reciprocity. What it means is that if you send a wave in one direction or if you send the wave in the other direction, it doesn't really matter, you will have the same response. Well, if you have material parameters that depend on time, you can break this reciprocity. So you can have different response depending on from which side you send your wave. Another another uh, topic which is kind of interesting at, at the moment are these floquet topological insulators. So briefly put, topological insulators which somehow come from the fact that the material parameters depend on time. Of course, if you allow time-dependent parameters, then you you gain more degrees of freedom and you can expect more phenomena to appear. So this is kind of a, a, a some of the questions that are currently being researched in this in this field and i should mention this field of time dependent materials is kind of recent but it's it's very a lot of people are interested in, in it at the moment but for us we will be interested in sub wavelength meter materials so i think many of you are probably familiar but just quickly recap what it means we want to somehow manipulate waves on length scales beyond the, the diffraction limit so classically, we cannot localize waves to areas which are smaller than half the wavelength, but we want to go beyond this. This is typically important, for example, in acoustics, where sometimes you have wavelengths of several meters. Now, if you want to kind of control these waves, you want to do it in a sub-wavelength regime in order to reduce the size of your device. And of course, as you probably are aware, we can achieve this through meter materials. Now, briefly put, we have some small scale, small scale structure that gives a kind of large scale exotic behavior. And more specifically, in order to do it on a sub wavelength length scale, we need a locally resonant microstructure. What it means is that we have some small scale structure which exhibit a resonance at the wavelength which is much larger than the structure. Or if you want, the structure itself is very small compared to the operating wavelength. Specifically, we will, we will work with high contrast resonators. Um, and I think somehow this goes back to 1933, when Marcel Minert was the first to describe the resonance of an air bubble. 
So he had a he had a system like this. He would he would create tiny air bubbles and he would listen to these bubbles and they would sing or sound at a certain pitch. And he would relate the pitch to the volume of the bubble. Now later on, people realized that these air bubbles, they have a fundamental impact on wave propagation in water. You can use this to your advantage. For example, if you have a construction site, you generate some blast, it gives a shock, shock wave and you have some sensitive object over here that you want to protect. Well, you can have a screen of air bubbles, which prevents the shock wave from reaching the sensitive object. All of this works because of high, that high contrast. So the air bubble is much lighter than the water around it. There's a contrast in the density. And this gives this sub-wavelength resonance phenomenon that I mentioned earlier. So some of the goal for us, um, there is a, a variety of phenomena that can appear in systems of high contrast resonators. The goal for us will be to kind of generalize the theory that exists already for the static case and to generalize it to the case of time dependent resonators. Okay, so we will look at a system that you can think of it as somehow uh, inclusions that somehow resemble an air bubble. It's not really an air bubble, but we have uh, a heterogeneous material. So we have two different materials and we have inclusions of another material. Uh, and we consider the wave equation in such a medium. So we have a unit cell um, and inside the unit cell, we have capital N number of resonators. And this is repeated periodically in two or three dimensions. Moreover, we have the material parameters, so kappa and rho, um, they will be piecewise constant in X. So they attain a certain value inside and a certain value outside. And moreover, we will assume that they are periodic also in the time dimension. Uh, so outside of the resonators, we will assume they are constant. Inside of the resonators, we assume that they are modulated periodically. So think of it as we have some material that we can control the material parameters of. So fundamentally, we define this contrast parameter. It's similar to the case of an air bubble where we had the contrast in the density. Uh, now it will be, it, in general, it will depend on time, but we assume that uniformly in time, it's a very small number. So the goal for us will be to kind of derive a general theory somehow in order to study these, these high contrast resonators. And we will see, we'll see the capacitance matrix. And it offers a very general method to study these systems. It offers a discrete approximation to a continuous PD problem. Based on this capacitance matrix, we will demonstrate so-called K gaps. This is a kind of a generalization of the band gaps that we're used to, but to the time dependent setting. And also based on the capacitance matrix, we will see that degenerate points can give rise to broken reciprocity that I mentioned in earlier, and also so-called exceptional points. So at this point, there are a lot of words thrown around. Of course, all of this will be explained in detail as we go along. Okay, so we will, we will devote quite a lot of time to the static case. So of course, before we go to the modulated case, we need to understand how the static case behaves. So if we, in this part of the talk, we will assume that all material parameters are constant in time. Later on, we will make them periodic in time. Okay, so of course, in the spatial di direction, we have periodicity. So we have a periodic problem. We will solve, we will approach it using Floquet block theory. I think many of you are familiar, but I will briefly outline the main, main ideas. So we define the dual lattice, which is basically the defined through the dual vectors of the original lattice. So for example, alpha one here is orthogonal to L2. Then we define the Brillouin zone, which is the torus. So it's a torus, RD modulo the dual lattice. Now the Brillouin zone is the natural space for the so-called quasi-periodicities. We say a function is quasi-periodic if it's periodic up to a phase factor. So when we move across a unit cell, it picks up a phase of alpha. Now you can think of this alpha as quasi-periodicity or if you want quasi-momentum. So this is the crystal momentum if you want. I guess a picture is something like this. If we have a, a Brillouin zone like this diamond here, it can equivalently be represented by this hexagon. Okay, now, crucially, in the static case, the problem is much simpler. And the reason is that we can apply the, the Fourier transform to the wave equation and we receive the Helmholtz equation. 
So in the static case, we have the Helmholtz equation and we have transmission conditions on the boundary of the resonators. So this is a PDE equation. It is independent on time. And crucially, we assume this high contrast condition that I mentioned earlier. So you see the contrast parameter delta appears here. We assume that all these parameters are very small. Mm, so this is a spectral problem for a periodic PD. And of course, we additionally assume the quasi-periodic condition. So we impose additionally the quasi-periodic condition. So this is the Floquet block assumption. And really what we're doing here, the periodic problem is that it has a continuous spectrum might look something like this. But when we apply the Floquet block condition, we're basically parameterizing the spectrum and we get for each point in the parameter space, it has a discrete spectrum. So it's much easier to analyze. Uh, here shown in the case of a band gap. So these functions here are known as the band functions and we have a gap between. To regain the original spectrum, we just take a union over all the band functions. Okay, so in order to solve the Helmholtz equation, we will use a layer potential technique. So in order to define the layer potentials, we will first have to start with the Green's functions. So this is the Green's function either in two dimensions or three dimensions. Then we define the single layer potential, essentially as convolution with the Green's function uh, around the boundary of some domain. We have the Neumann point core operator, which is convolution. Instead of the Green's function, we have the normal derivative of the Green's function. Okay, so these are kind of standard vari variants. Then we can also define the quasi-periodic variants. In this case, we start with the quasi-periodic Green's function, uh, which is defined in terms of the original Green's function like this. And then we have similarly, we have the quasi-periodic single layer potential and quasi-periodic Neumann point core operator defined analogously, but with different, different kernels inside. So the reason we want to use these is that the layer potentials can be used to represent solutions to your equation. So remember, use the solution to the Helmholtz equation. It can be represented by the single layer potentials, uh, either outside of the resonators or in inside of the resonators. Mm, and really what happens here is that we're starting with a PD equation. We're reformulating it into a integral equation. So we now have an equation in terms of these integral operators S and K. And what it looks like is through this highlighted equation here, which is essentially a nonlinear eigenvalue problem if you want. So these tilde operators is just a way to take into account the different, different material parameters inside each resonator. So the theorem here is that the band functions to the PD equation are given by the characteristic values of this integral operator, or if you want, the nonlinear eigenvalues of this nonlinear eigenvalue problem. Now, of course, this is kind of how we approach the problem, but there's a very simple idea that underlines it. So if we forget about the integral operators for a while and just look at the equation itself, there's a very simple idea that underlies, underlies the capacitance approximation. So remember, we are in the high contrast regime, which means that delta is very small. Moreover, we're in the subwavelength regime, which means that omega is very small. So our equation looks something like this. What happens if we throw away omega and delta? Well, what we get is essentially Laplace's equation with Neumann condition on the inside. Of course, the solution will be constant on each resonator. So we can define the basis functions, some functions which satisfies Laplace's equation and are constant on each resonator. The picture is something like this. The first basis function has value one, zero, zero. The second one has value zero, one, zero, and so on. And somehow we expect these functions to, to kind of generate the solution that we're looking for. Now through these functions, we can define the capacitance matrix. Um, now here I should remark that of course, the word capacitance, it comes from electrostatics. You can think of this characteristic function here, it's a unit potential. So when you take the inverse of the single layer potential, you get the charge distribution and then you integrate the charge distribution to get the total charge. So it's a total charge given a unit potential, this is capacitance. Okay, but uh, so that's in terms of electrostatics, but of course it exists kind of in a more general framework. So this is capacitance matrix. We also define the generalized capacitance matrix. 
which is basically just we're taking into account different material parameters inside each resume. Now, with this framework at hand, we have the, the, the first theorem, which is the, the, I think, the main theorem in the static case. So remember, we're still in the static case. All material parameters are constant. So the theorem is that there are capital N band functions. Remember, N is the number of resonators inside the unit cell. So we have N band functions, and they can be approximated by the eigenvalues of the capacitance matrix, of the generalized capacitance matrix. Moreover, the block modes can be approximated by the eigenvectors of the capacitance matrix, generalized capacitance matrix. The formula are like this. The band function is given by square root of the eigenvalue. The block modes are given by a linear combination of these basis functions that announced that we had before. So really what we do here, we start with a spectral problem for a PD, we reduce it to an eigenvalue problem for a matrix, if you want. Okay, another, another um, thing worth highlighting here, um, the eigenvalues, they have a factor of delta inside. Remember, delta is the high contrast parameter, it's very small. It means that these band functions, they will be very small, they scale like square root delta, when delta is small. So really what the picture here is that we have a bunch of band functions, which are very small. Above them, we have a band gap, which, which is in the sub-wavelength regime. Above this band gap, we have even more band functions, but these band functions above, they will no longer be, they are not sub-wavelength. So we have basically a separation of scales here where we have a bunch of band functions which are very close to zero. Now, I should also mention here that there are similarities here to the so-called tight binding approximation commonly used in quantum mechanics. So uh, it's also a discrete approximation of a continuous problem. I should say though, that there are also fundamental differences. Most notably, this capacitance matrix has long range interactions. We're in a classical wave system. There are long range interactions and it makes it somehow more complicated. So even though there are similarities, there are also fundamental differences compared to the tight binding approximation. Okay, so there are a few regimes if we stay in the static case for just a while longer. The kind of the, the standard regime is of course, if all the material parameters are positive real numbers. In this case, the generalized capacitance matrix is similar to our emission matrix. We can prove that all the eigenvalues are positive real numbers and everything sort of makes sense. Now, if we allow the material parameters to be complex, then crucially this matrix is no longer emission. And well, complex parameters, what does it mean? We can think of it as energy input and energy output. So there's some amplification or damping going on. Now, of course, since you have a non-emission matrix, what could happen is that the matrix is not diagonalizable. Um, and this has a name, it's known as an exceptional point. So it's somehow a point where somehow the eigenmodes, they become parallel and the system is no longer diagonalizable. And well, in order to achieve this, typically we should have so-called PT symmetry. You can think of it as, well, what it stands for is parity time symmetry. So um, when we swap the X direction and we swap the T direction, we get back the same thing, basically. Another way to think about it is that the gain and loss, the energy input and energy output, they are balanced. So here you see, still in the static case, uh, band functions. So we have two band functions, one here and one here. And at some point there's a, de there's a degeneracy and this point is an exceptional point. And crucially, it's also, we can think of this point as a point where we pick up an imaginary part to the band functions. So here the spectrum is real. After the, after the exceptional point, the spectrum is now complex. Okay, so all of this can be achieved in the static case, but fundamentally, if we compare C alpha to C minus alpha, so we're kind of swapping the space direction, either propagation in this direction, or propagation in this direction, uh, they will always be related to each other. So C alpha conjugate is always C minus alpha. Uh, it means that reciprocity will always be preserved. No matter what, in these systems, you cannot break reciprocity if you have static parameters. Mm, 
So somehow in order to achieve more phenomena, for example, bro broken reciprocity, we really need to consider time dependent materials. Okay, so now that we know a lot of the static case, we now turn to the time dependent case. So just to remind ourselves of the setting, we now have the wave equation. So really we don't have any more of the Helmholtz equation, but we really have the wave equation. Again, we have material parameters kappa, we have rho. They are now, they're no longer constant, but they're now periodic in time. So we have some frequency capital omega, and crucially we now, again, we have this high contrast parameter, which is again, assumed to be small uniformly in time. Okay, so in the static case, of course, we had a Floquet block theory in the spatial direction. Now in the time modulated case, we again have a Floquet block theory, but now in the somehow time dimension. So we have another Brillouin zone, somehow the time Brillouin zone, and it's the space of quasi frequencies. So instead of quasi momenta, you have quasi frequencies. The picture might be something like this. In the static case, you have a frequency axis, but in the modulated case, all of this gets kind of folded onto just a single unit cell. Uh, and the width, the width of this unit cell is given by this capital omega here. Now, somehow in order to have interesting physics happening, we want to choose capital omega so that it's in the same order as the static resonance. So remember, in the static case, we have band functions and they scale like square root delta, where delta is the high contrast parameter. So somehow in order to kind of excite these resonances, we want to choose a modulation fre frequency capital omega, which has the same order in terms of delta. What it means is, well, it means that the width of this Brillouin zone, it's very small when delta is very small. Another way to think about it, well, all your frequencies will be in the subwavelength regime somehow, or rather, the subwavelength regime is no longer well defined because now all your frequencies will be of the order square root delta because all your frequencies live inside the Brillouin zone. I guess somehow another way to think about it, if you look, if you compare the the frequency axis here to the Brillouin zone over here, uh, if you take a large frequency, which is the green one it gets folded to a very small frequency, which is the green one over here. And somehow it's not clear what, is, what means of wavelength anymore. It's not enough to look at the frequencies in order to define what is a subwavelength frequency. So we think of it in, the, in terms of the eigenmodes instead. We say that a quasi frequency is subwavelength if the corresponding eigenmode, roughly speaking, is dominated by low frequency components. So somehow, the corresponding eigenmode is not too rapidly oscillating. That's what it means to be subwavelength. Mathematically speaking, of course, the eigenmode has a block expansion like this. And if we truncate the block expansion, then we make an error, which is not too large when delta goes to zero. So this is how we define what it means to be subwavelength in the time modulated case. So with this definition at hand, we can now analyze the subwavelength uh, eigenmodes of the system. So if we start with a block expansion, something like this, we can insert it into the wave equation and we can look at the equation satisfied by these, these uh, functions V, if you want. And of course, we get something that looks like a Helmholtz equation, but it's not really a Helmholtz equation. Rather, it's, if you want, it's a system of infinitely many coupled Helmholtz equations. So the first line here, the first line looks exactly like a Helmholtz equation. It's a line for in terms of V. The second line also kind of looks like a Helmholtz equation, but it's not really posed in terms of V. It's rather posed in terms of the convolution of V with rho. So rho is the material parameter. It depends on T. So you, you take the convolution and then you get this V star. And then V double star is convolution now with one over rho, one over kappa, basically. Mm. So another way to think about this. You have infinitely many coefficients v. Uh, each of them satisfies a Helmholtz equation, but all of these Helmholtz equations are coupled to each other. 
So really, mathematically speaking, this is a horrible, horrible equation. It's very hard to solve, and it's kind of hard to know where to start. But since we're dealing in the, again in the sub-wavelength regime, we have a similar intuition as before. Remember, delta is very small, omega is very small, and since we're dealing with the lowest frequency components, we can kind of truncate this if we're looking at the sub-wavelength modes. So this coefficient here will be very small, this will be very small, this will be very small. Again, we have something that looks like Laplace's equation with Neumann conditions on the inside, and this function V star will be approximately constant. Now, of course, there are some details that you have to work out, but based on this idea, we can again prove a capacitance approximation, which is quite similar to the one we had before. So the theorem is as follows. Again, it's a capacitance approximation. We have the capacitance matrix here, but now it's no longer a matrix equation, but now it's a system of ordinary differential equations. So the statement is that the quasi frequencies of the wave equation in the subwavelength regime are given by the quasi frequencies of this system of ODs. So really the way to think about it, I think is something like this. In the static case, there is no time dimension. Um, you integrate the space dimensions to get just a, just a matrix equation. In the time dependent case, well, you have four, four unknowns now. You have one, space, one time dimension and three space dimensions. You integrate the space dimensions and you have one dimension left. And then you get, instead of a PD equation, four dimensional PD equation, you get a one dimensional OD equation. Now, of course, this is a system of OD equations, but really what we have here is something that looks, I mean, you can write like this. It's a second order equation. And this coefficient matrix here, it's a periodic one. So this is known as a Hill equation. It's kind of a general, general form of the equation. So we have here a system of Hill equations. And of course, this OD equation, it's much easier to analyze both theoretically or numerically. So this equation here, it gives us a starting point to analyze physical phenomena that happen in these systems. And we can do so both theoretically and numerically in a very straightforward manner. It's much easier to analyze the OD than the PD. So somehow the first question, I think, the most natural question are band gaps. And now we are not interested in band gaps in the frequency domain, but we're interested in band gaps in the momentum domain. And these are the so-called K gaps. So if we start with a single resonator in a square lattice, so we take a resonator, look something like this, it's repeated periodically. If you look at the static band structure, so we know the material parameters of the, are constant in time, it looks something like this. Mm, now, when we put a time dependency on the, on the material parameters, we have to first kind of fold this one because we live now in the, we, we don't have frequencies anymore, but we have quasi frequencies. So if we still look at the static structure, but we fold it at some frequency, well, you see what happens. We start with something like this, but then at some point we kind of introduce a maximum and then everything above this maximum will get folded uh, into the Brillouin zone like this. You see, we start with something like this and then it folds like this. So this is still the static structure. Now we put some modulation to the parameters. And it might look something like this. Here you see at the edge of the Brillouin zone, which is right here, um, we get an imaginary part to the, to the band functions. Another way to put it, for this, real free, for this real momentum that lives here, there's no corresponding frequency because the, frequency, the momentum here is complex. Um, so this is, this is exactly what it means to have a band gap. But the band gap is now, the band gap is not in this direction, but can get back, it's rather in this direction. So here we have these K gaps or the gaps in the momentum direction. As you mentioned, these K gaps, well, if you, if you well, of course, a band gap in a, that we're used to, a band gap in the frequency direction, of course, they correspond to modes that cannot propagate inside, to, inside your material. So they correspond to frequencies that decay exponentially inside your material. Conversely, these K gaps, they correspond to momenta that 
will be either decaying or exponentially growing. So it depends on the sign of the imaginary part here. And it might happen that the sign is positive corresponding to growing, exponentially growing uh, eigenmoles. Um, and well, the reason this can happen is the fact that when we have time modulated materials, there will no longer be energy conservation. So it might happen that you kind of the time modulation inserts energy into your modes and the modes kind of grow more and more. So they are exponentially growing. Of course, this cannot happen in the, in the static case. We cannot have exponentially growing modes because we have energy conservation. But in the, in the modulated case, the energy conservation is broken and then we can have growing modes. Okay, so the, I think the band gaps, they are kind of the easiest, the first question you should ask. But then you can ask, what about further phenomena? So I think the, the observation here, the key observation is that if we start with a static structure and we, we, when we, before we put on the modulation, we should look at the folded structure. Um, so the static band structure might look something like this and then we fold it. And then when we do so, we might induce generate points. So if we have some frequency around here, we fold the top band to the second, to the lower band, and you see there are intersections here. Now in the static case, these, they're not really degeneracies because you see in the, this is real picture, they don't intersect. But in the modulated picture, of course, they, what, what might happen is that the top band and the lower band, they might start interacting with, with each other. They might start behaving as there, is, there are degeneracies. And so what we'll see later on is that around these so-called degenerate points, very interesting phenomena can, can happen. So we should also define in a similar idea, the folding number. So folding number, what it means is that essentially it's the, the number of times you need to fold the top, top band to reach the lower band, so to speak. In this case, the folding number is one because you see we have the top band up here, the lower band down here, we have a center frequency of fold it once and then, then they intersect. So this is the number of times we should fold one of the bands to reach the other, so to speak. So somehow, if we put a shallow modulation or a small time modulation, we should think of it as a perturbation of this structure rather than this structure. So if we have, um, if we have a system where the, the coefficient matrix, it's given by a constant one, constant in time, plus epsilon, where epsilon is a small number, times something that depends periodically. So we have kind of small modulation amplitude. Um, we can of course expand this, this coefficient matrix as a Fourier series because it's, it's, it's a periodic function. Um, we assume that the Fourier series is finite. This is for simplicity. So you can think of it as we have some cosine modulation or something like this. And crucially, we also assume that the modulation has no average. The time average is zero. This is not really a strong assumption because, well, if there is some time average, you can kind of put it into the static part, so to speak. Okay, so of course you can ask questions like, well, if we put a small, um, small modulation here, what happens to the quasi frequencies? What happens to the band function? Um, so we can do we can we can do asymptotic analysis based on on eigenvalue perturbation theory. And the result is that if you are at a regular point, in other words, you're not at a and you're not at a de degenerate point. Um, your frequency omega, if this this is the static frequency, it will get perturbed, but it there is no linear part. So how the perturbation will be of order epsilon square. So this is kind of surprising that there is no there is no linear part of the perturbation, so to speak. But rather differently, if you start at the, if you start at the uh, degenerate point, um, there will indeed be some some perturbation here in the linear in the linear uh, case somehow. So there will be a perturbation that scales like epsilon, and there will be of course higher perturbations. Interestingly, so okay, so so there is there's kind of a fundamental difference in the behavior of the asymptotic behavior of regular points and degenerate points. And moreover, interestingly, this linear perturbation term, it only depends on the Fourier coefficients of order n, 
So this, this omega one is a function of mn and m minus n, which are the Fourier coefficients of, uh, of order n, where n is the folding number associated to this degenerate point. I think a way to think about this is that if you start with a static structure uh, and then you put some modulation to the static structure, uh, the Fourier modes will induce a coupling between frequencies uh, associated to each of the Fourier harmonics, so to speak. So if you have a frequency here, it, this frequency will get coupled to all frequencies uh, which are equivalent modulo capital omega. Um, of course, we can use, we can do um, eigenvalue perturbation theory to get an explicit formula for this, for this coefficient here. There's kind of a horrible ex expression, but it, essentially you have to diagonalize a certain matrix and then multiply the matrix coefficients. So I will not define carefully what it means, but there are explicit formulas for this, for this coefficient. So now with this theory at hand, we can explain a variety of phenomena. So if we start again with the, the system I showed you before, if we have two resonators inside a unit cell, we have two bands, one of them folds onto the other, we have degenerate points here. If we put a PT symmetric modulation of kappa, so PT, what it, again, what it means, parity time symmetric, it's, it's invariant under parity and time uh, inverse. Mm, around these points, we might have exceptional points. So what happens is something like this. You see this, these degenerate points, in the neighborhood of them, we get exceptional points here and here, which are parameter points, again, where the spectrum goes from being real to being complex and conjugate symmetric. So these degenerate points, they all kind of open in the neighborhood to exceptional points. You can think about this as this linear perturbation term. It's a complex, complex number. It gives you some imaginary part to your band functions. So it shows that we can achieve exceptional points, not, not through complex parameters, but through time dependent parameters. Another very interesting example that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, what about broken reciprocity? So indeed we can achieve it in this, in this case. If we start with a system with three resonators inside a unit cell, we will have three, three bands. Uh, if we fold it, they, there will be the degenerate points here and here. Now, when so this is the static structure. When we put some modulation to the structure, these degenerate points might open into band gaps. And you see what happens here. So here you see the red the red lines here. The red lines indicate indicate band gaps. And crucially, if you look in the plus omega direction or the minus omega direction, the band gaps are different. What it means is that you have unidirectional band gaps, where if you put a frequency in kind of, which is in one of the band gaps, but not the other, that frequency will propagate in one direction, but not the other. So for example, a frequency that lives within the big band gap, but not the small band gap, that frequency will only propagate to the right, it will not propagate to the left. So it means that inside of these structures, we can break reciprocity. We can have unidirectional band gaps, where we have frequencies that are propagating in only a single direction. Uh, if we look closer, you can, so if we fix alpha to be at these degenerate points, so if I, if I quickly go back, you see at these degenerate points, we fix the quasi-periodicity here. And then we look at the functions as a function of epsilon. Epsilon is the strength of the time modulation. You see here, we have alpha plus minus degenerate point. So, uh, we have somehow the red ones are at the, in the minus direction, the plus ones are in the positive direction, and you see they're really disjoint. Um, and kind of the red one is co contains the blue one, so to speak. And in this picture, we also clearly see the, the distinction between degenerate points and regular points. So up here we have degenerate points, they are perturbed linearly. The regular points here, they are perturbed quadratically. So there's a really fundamental asymptotic behavior between these two these two types of points. And again, to highlight, if you have a frequency that lives within, well, outside of the blue, but within the red, then that frequency will only propagate in one direction, 
Okay, so we can achieve exceptional points. We can achieve uh, non-reciprocity. We can achieve K gaps. The question is what, what more can we achieve in these systems? Um, so I think, and this is not, I, I think this is kind of work in progress, um, the flocate topological insulators. Can we achieve topological, topological edge modes in these systems? Somehow the natural thing to start with here is a honeycomb structure where we, through the material parameters, we can kind of create an artificial spin if you want. So it's not really, I mean, the resonators, they're fixed, they don't move, but through the time dependency, we can put uh, a, a rot rotating phase, so to speak, a modulation phase. And this way we can create some kind of artificial spin and the hope here, or um, I think what we, I think what, what is possible to achieve here if we put an edge to this structure is we can get chiral edge modes. Um, now, if we just look at the infinite structure, we can of course compute the band, band structure. And interestingly, we of course have Dirac cones at the edge of the Brillouin zone, but we can also get Dirac, Dirac cones at the center of the Brillouin zone. Mm. So this is for the infinite structure for a kind of future work would be to truncate the structure and show that we can have we can have chiral edge modes propagating in only one direction. Okay, so with that, I want to start wrapping up just for the conclusion. Um, I think somehow the main point here is the capacitance approximation. And it's a very, it's a very general theory and it, it can be solved, for the, it can be used for the static case. It can also be used for the time modulated case. Um, so it kind of gives a unified mathematical theory for these high contrast resonators. In the time modulated case, what we did, we start with a PDE problem, it's a four dimensional PDE, it's a wave equation. We reduce it to a one dimensional ODE. The ODE, it's a system of Hill, it's a system of Hill equations, basically. So we have, it's a second order ODE where the coefficient matrix is periodic in time. It lends itself very naturally to both, uh, both theoretical studies and numerical studies. So based on this OD capacitance approximation, we could demonstrate K gaps, which are similar to band gaps, but instead of the frequency direction, they're in the momentum direction. We also saw these degenerate points, which have a significantly different asymptotic behavior in terms of the small parameter epsilon here. And around these degenerate points, we could, we could see either exceptional points or unidirectional band gaps. Okay, so with that, I want to thank you for your attention and open the floor for discussion. Wonderful, thank you, Eric. Very nice talk as ever. Uh, okay, so we have time for questions now. I have a bunch of questions, but I would like to give everybody else the opportunity to ask a question first. Uh, so please go ahead, either unmute yourself or use the chat. You can raise your hand if you wanna be really polite about it. Does anybody have any questions for Eric? <laughs> 